Right. Let's talk about, uh, so as you know, we're, we're governance experts. We're really, really familiar with uh, governance. And uh, I know that we tend to get a lot of programming professionals at events like this. Um, I have some, I don't know if it's bad news, but let's just say it's news for a lot of folks. The code that you write is less than half of the struggle of getting a working blockchain system up running and working in the world with users actively using it. This technology is less than half the problem. The, the larger half, the larger section that isn't technology is wrangling the people. Uh, it is meaningless to have a single user blockchain. It is not, it's often not helpful to have a single company blockchain, although at times it is very helpful. Uh, you really need to mobilize people and get them to commit to use the system. And then as it's becoming more and more functional to actually get them involved in using it and not waiting, not saying, gosh, that's interesting, come back to us later. We see this routinely. Uh, my colleagues tell me that 94%, I repeat that, 94% of blockchain efforts get as far as the proof of concept and then fail. We're lucky that even 6% move on to be successful and attract users and go out and solve problems in the world. Now, a 94% failure rate is horrible, and I don't wish that on you, but it's worse because people tend to be high profile and excited about their blockchain projects. And then when it stalls, it, it reflects on you. It hurts your career. And uh, right now, we've got an industry that is hurting the professional reputations of some of the best people in the companies and in the industry because we're not paying proper attention to governance. And more so than that, not paying yes. proper attention to stakeholders. Yeah. Bingo. So and when I say well-designed, uh, these well-designed blockchain projects are failing um, and it's not because they're not well built technically. Usually that's, people put a lot of time and energy into that. If you read the popular press, all the articles are about, you know, oh, the, the consensus mechanism or, wow, there's new blockchain came out with this cool feature and, oh, Hedera Hashgraph, oh, look, you know, the new Hyperledger, who's he, what's it? Uh, don't assume that the amount of words written about a topic reflects the importance of the topic. Governance is key. You cannot scale without governance and you can't understand your governance without understanding your stakeholders. Yep. Um, and if you don't provide stakeholders with the proper opportunities to co-create in a lot of these systems, then this is the worst case scenario for a heavily invested uh, in enterprise blockchain project. Yeah. And not, you don't have to co-create with every single possible stakeholder, but you need enough representative stakeholders that the ones who come late see their professional colleagues, they see their competitors in there already using your system. They're like, oh, it must be okay. It must be safe. Look, if, if Pfizer is using it, then Genentech will say, oh, Pfizer is using it. Okay. It, it must work. And, and Pfizer didn't maybe design it, you know, an independent third party designed it. So I'm not getting in bed with my competitor in a way that benefits my competitor over me. So yeah, you, you get the idea. Mm-hmm. So pre-governance, uh, we believe, is just as important as governance. Uh, so we all know that governance and how you design your systems can do a lot for the success of your network. It makes decision-making smooth. But before you even get to governance, there's a lot of work on the back end. Um, and a lot of that work involves stakeholder analysis. Uh, so that's identifying who exactly is participating in your DLT system. That's not just now, but in the future. Who do you want to participate in the future? identifying how these groups interact with each other and yourself um, and collecting all the information needed um, on the risks associated with these different interactions between parties that you'll need to create these later governance mechanisms. Um, and then, of course, most importantly, uh, persuading a subset of your stakeholders to co-create with you. This makes sure that you're building something that's actually useful and simultaneously instills that sense of stakeholder commitment to the system. Absolutely. So real quick, these are just some distinctions between pre-governance and governance. Um, some of the areas that governance help with, uh, governance helps with is, um, you know, help 
decision making happen smoothly, enforce rules, et cetera. Um, and then pre-governance helps you prepare to build your governance. So in this workshop specifically, um, we want to have you leave with the tools necessary to conduct uh, a full pre-governance analysis. And we've uh, developed some take-home activities um, for you as well to practice some of the skills necessary to do pre-governance analysis, which we'll get to later. And just, just to be clear, uh, we, we could talk to you all day about what you ought to do, but some skills have to be practiced for you to get good at them. Mm -hmm. And that includes things around interviewing and listening. So the, the, the thing we're going to have you practice there, and we'll demonstrate the practice, uh, has to do with empathic listening. Uh, I promise you, every time I teach this, my students come back to me a day or a week later and say, oh my gosh, I used this skill at home. You'll never believe my relationship with my family is so much better. My coworkers, my my." My roommates, uh, they just gush. You'll never believe. I totally believe, folks. You will find this pays off to you everywhere in your life. It's one of the reasons we, we make it a foundational skill. So let's talk about this pre-governance uh, analysis. Uh, the outcome, you, you know you've got the pre-governance done correctly when you've got these outcomes, right? You know your target stakeholders, right? Who is it that we're going to persuade to do the investment necessary in IT system changes, in process changes, in training their people to do some things differently, maybe re-engineering portions of their business to, to work with uh, this, this thing you're creating. You know how the different groups or types of stakeholders cooperate or get into conflict with each other. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my favorite uh, instances of a very successful commercial blockchain system today is a, a niche product called Grain Chain. And what Grain Chain does is it unites the growers of grain with the buyers, the wholesale buyers, and the grain silo operators who store the grain after harvest before purchase. And what used to happen is the farmers would just sell to the grain operator, or the elevator operator, who had an incentive to uh, say, oh, this grain's not very good, to get the price down. And that same grain elevator operator would turn around to the wholesale buyer and say, oh, the grain's excellent, and, and try to you know, maximize the difference in the price he paid versus the price he charged. Uh, and of course, if the pressures worked against him, you end up paying more to the farmer than you get from the wholesaler, and now you're losing your shirt. So they're really kind of caught in the middle. Uh, it, you can make money, but the money you make, you're taking out of other people's pockets. You're not really being paid for the value you're creating in that position. Uh, and what Grain Chain was able to do was understand the, the friction points in such a way as to design a system that really reflected the interests of all the parties. Uh, they understood by talking to the farmers and the grain silo operators and the buyers uh, and the, even the banks and the financing people, what the challenges in the industry were and how they routinely get in conflict with each other so that they could design a governance system that respected that and g gave them a uh, space to cooperate. So that's where, that, that's the, you want to do the same kind of thing. So to do that, you need skills like empathic listening, the skills of interviewing, and then having gathered information, you need to do some storytelling and some mapping in order to show the stakeholders what everybody else told you so they can all see everything from everybody else's point of view. Uh, so those are the skills. And if you don't already have them, don't worry with practice, you can, you can build them. All right, so we mentioned pre-governance analysis gives you what you need to build out your governance system. Uh, think of it as having these three chunks. There's an identifying your stakeholders phase, and you may think you're done and you're not. You might have overlooked somebody. So you always want to keep an open mind as to, you know, have I overlooked a stakeholder class? Uh, you then need to understand them deeply through listening and interviews. And you need to engage with them. Uh, you don't expect to, you know, sign up every single silo operator on the planet the first day, but you better have a couple of them early on uh, that you've engaged with who are willing to look at your prototypes and try out your beta uh, and so forth. Okay. 
you can think of stakeholder commitment as changing over time. And this graph time goes from left to right, from the start of the system on, on the left, where it says, you know, the time axis is start, and then time moves to the right until you get to the maturity of your system. And as you see, you're adding stakeholders over time and later joiners don't need to have as much depth of commitment, but they still have to have some. There's a dotted horizontal line called skin in the game. And people who never really have a deep commitment, the transactional customers, like your wallet users, if you go you know, business to commercial or business to consumer, uh, some people really don't have founders who join you. Very deep commitment, you're doing a lot of work. And that vertical line there through the co-founders is the moment in which you really start the work. You need to get these co-creating early stakeholders, your advisory board, you need to get them recruited uh, during pre-governance, so you've got people to talk to and people to show alphas and betas to. The folks who join later, they're never going to spend that much time co-creating. They're not going to get into the alphas and the betas with you. Uh, and so their depth of commitment is just lower, but they're still having to commit. And even people who just uh, uh, stake some funds in order to be a, a vendor or in order to you know, be a, a listed person on the system, they're still, they're, they're still committing some, but you want to make it as easy as possible later on for folks to just integrate to your API, stake some tokens or, or otherwise show their seriousness or put up a bond uh, and, and get involved. Okay, great. How do you identify stakeholders? Well, think of stakeholders as having, uh, being uh, spread out across uh, three different categories. The two major categories are the actors and the members. And that because those two overlap, you get three subsets. So all of the actors are all the people who have some uh, say in governance. They get to vote, they get to make proposals. Remember that if governance is just decision making for a group, then in some sense, it's simple, right? We propose a change and then we talk about it and then we maybe we vote or, or come to consensus on whether to do the change and then we schedule it and we do it. And that's true of tiny changes like uh, little, little tweaks, uh, bug fixes to major changes like adding a new chunk of functionality. They all go through that cycle. And so if a person has any ability to affect governance decisions, they're an actor, okay? And then you've got people who are affected by governance decisions. And that's the, the yellow large uh, hexagon on the right. And, that, and so the actors on the left, that includes both operators and stakeholders, and the members on the right include both Betrofenin and stakeholders. And so the stakeholders are both actors and members. They're the only ones who are. So who's an actor who's not a member? They're called operators. That's the technical term we've, we've uh, come up with. And they include people like regulators. Right, they have an impact. You might give them a formal impact. They might have an informal impact, but they get to say and do things that ch that have an impact on the governance of your chain. If there's a mandatory uh, disclosure that you have to comply with, you might have to change your technology. You have to change your code to to comply with that mandate. Oops. Okay, that's an operator for you. That they, they don't have to make any changes to their systems. They just tell you what to do. Stakeholders are in both uh, actors and members. People who are affected by governance decisions but have no say are a special category, and we use a German word, betroffenen, because we could not find an English word uh, that has the right nuance. And so by switching languages, we're, we're picking out, you know, if you drop a German word into an English conversation, everyone knows you're like, what? You're, you're saying something very specific. And what we mean specifically here is people who are affected by governance but don't have a say. In a democracy, you want that group to be very small. And in a blockchain system, you want that group to at least be very discreet. Uh, most likely it's going to be the transactional customers who don't have to make any changes and really don't deserve uh, a say. Uh, so for instance, if we were doing a banking consortium and the banks had to cooperate in a certain way, you wouldn't give the customers of the bank a vote on how the banks operate amongst themselves, likely you wouldn't. Um, in part because all they would do would be lobby for low interest rates on loans and high interest rates on deposits and then the banks all go out of business. And that's 
probably an unwise thing in the long term. So here are your categories. You're going to sort people into these groups. The next thing you're going to do is interview and understand these stakeholder groups by finding representative individuals and going and talking to them. And here's where many computer science uh, students uh, and professionals are perhaps not as well equipped as we might like. Uh, and that is empathic listening. It's not enough to talk to people. You must talk to them in such a way that they feel understood. And if you do this right, you will find that for most people, feeling understood is indistinguishable from feeling loved. I cannot overstate the importance of this. They may not say it to you, um, but practice this where you're the one being listened to. Uh, we're going to give you a practice exercise you do in a group of three. And each of you will take a turn being understood. And you will find when the other people, when the listeners do this right, when the interviewers do this right, you will feel uh, a real sense of connection and, and for many people, a sense of relief. Uh, and it, it's very powerful emotionally to be understood. And this, by the way, is a great way to get your early stakeholders to commit is because they like this experience of being understood by you. It's kind of cool. And you need people hooked emotionally. Uh, when you're listening, this is the second bullet here, you need to listen not just for the words they say, but for what has heart and meaning. Like what's exciting to them? What are they struggling to express? What's the underlying point they're trying to make? Don't nitpick the words. And you want to listen without memory or agenda. In other words, you don't try to make them make sense compared to what they said last time. You're not trying to reconcile what they're saying with what somebody else said yesterday. Not yet. Later you will because you have to do an analysis. But that's not part of analysis and listening are different skills. And you want to listen for understanding rather than trying to, you know, so what you're saying is you'd like to buy today. No, that, that you're not trying to push people like with, pretend listening where you're trying to put words in their mouth or trying to steer the conversation or get them to agree with something they don't agree with. You really, really want to just let them have their say, even if it's irrational and bizarre, okay? Uh, like, be open to that. You literally don't want to steer them. You just want to hear them. Okay, so enough about that. So when you're listening, you want to ask non-leading questions. There's a technique uh, called clean language. Uh, there's a very good Wikipedia article explaining clean language. It's something that, th that therapists, some therapists use as a way of not steering their, their clients. Uh, and I find it extraordinarily helpful when I interview people to use clean language. I won't try to give you a tutorial on it. We'll just give that as research for you for later. Also, notice how the person's energy or their affect changes. If they seem to feel suddenly very tired, that's a sign. If they seem very excited or energized all of a sudden, that's probably good. Uh, if they seem angry or sad, look for those emotions. And then you want to not just try to imagine what it's like for them, but make it clear to them that you're trying to imagine what it's like for them. If you find yourself saying sentences like, wow, I imagine that must have felt, and then you make a guess what the feeling is, that's a very good technique. Gosh, I imagine... I imagine that really must have felt uh, great when you were able to blah, blah, blah. And then you sort of recap what they just told you. Uh, trying to imagine what the other person's feeling, even when you get it wrong, if you guess totally wrong, they'll just correct you. They're fine with that. The fact that you're trying to understand the, their emotional reality is huge. You're also going to listen for facts, mind you. So this is not just an emotional exercise. Uh, you're, as you're doing the interview, you're listening for things like stakeholder risk. Um, that's the risk to the stakeholder of engaging with the other stakeholders. You know, is, is, the, is the data going to leak out to my, co my competitors and they can see me talking to my customers? Uh, oops. You know, uh, several folks at IBM have referred to blockchains as digital nudist colonies. A, a nudist colony being a place where everyone walks around without clothes on and you know, I mean, blockchain, it, it, all the data is visible to all the users. And that can be scary as a stakeholder. Uh, there's operator risk, uh, having to do with the risk of the jointly maintained uh, operations, like regulatory noncompliance. There's systemic risk that affects everybody on your chain, or even your entire industry. And strategy risk. Uh, 
if you've got lack of clarity or lack, uh, lack of commitment or different competing strategies that are mutually incompatible, if you have a lack of shared values across players, that will show up. So you'll be listening for these kinds of things. And you want to engage these stakeholders. So now that you've interviewed them, you want to pull them in, at least a subset of them, and get them to be alpha testers, beta testers, co-creators with you of your governance regime. So you have to build trust. And the way to build trust with stakeholders is through transparency regarding your project and regarding your process. Don't overwhelm them with status reports, but keep them in the loop. Make sure you're asking them their opinions. Be careful not to set the expectation that if they just because they have an opinion that somehow you're going to uh, make a change, it's like, oh, I really don't like this. Like, okay, I hear you don't like it. I'm not promising that we can change it, but I, I promise you we'll look at it. Because if you, if sometimes when you listen to people in a certain way, they'll think that because you heard them that you're agreeing with them. Don't, you don't have to agree with somebody to, in order to hear them. Ask for their opinions without setting the wrong expectation. Make them feel heard. Empathic listening does that. And demonstrate that you care about their needs. And there's lots of ways to do that. When you do these things, you're transparent, you're asking their opinions, they feel heard, and they can see you trying to make an effort to respond to their needs, they'll feel trust with you. It doesn't guarantee they'll commit, but it sure raises the odds. And so now, yeah, now we're going to jump into our exciting stakeholder interview activity where, where you will learn some empathetic listening um, or empathic and, and, listening. And everything we're about to show you, we invite you and encourage you to do the exact same thing yourselves uh, after this. You'll get a copy to a handout, similar to what you're just going to see on screen. Get a, a group of you and two other people and run through this exercise at least three times. Yes. So I'm sending out a link to the pre-governance activity packet right now. So everyone, you'll find that in the Zoom webinar chat. Make sure you copy that. Uh, and after this activity uh, demonstration, you can get started. Hey, before we get into the activity, I want to just check something. The audience has not asked a single question. That either means that I've been, you and Kirsten and I have been so incredibly clear that no one has any questions, or we've completely like raced past you and you're baffled and you can't even think of a question because we're just not making any sense at all. So if you could please participants, I see 55 folks online. Can I get one or two people to just type in and say, hey, I get it or ah, Kenneth. Thank you, Kenneth. So he's okay. So Kenneth, okay. I got one person in the audience who is clear. Kenneth, thank you very, very much. If anybody else is paying attention and you know, is it, is it 80% clear? Like how clear are you feeling? In your, in your tracking of what we're saying, I guess is what I'm asking you to say. So please, if you're attendance, Kenneth is, is over the top clear, 101%. All right. Hard to be that well, clear. Wow, that's impressive. I, I, I feel, Kirsten, yeah, your, your preparation and mine has clearly paid off. Uh, okay, Tom, thank you, 70%, super. Uh, and so Tom, I'm going to put you on the spot just a tiny bit. If you can think of what would help get you the other 30%? Like, is there, is there a, a, a section that you're not clear on? Or is there a term? You may not know, and that's okay. Um, but it, Tom, if you can give us a sense of where your 30% of unclarity is, um, or you could just say, what, what's the part that's most clear for you? But I want Tom, I want asking Tom to dig a little deeper. I don't want to embarrass Tom because then the other 53 people in the audience will like, oh no, Tom got embarrassed. I won't, I'm not gonna say anything. And I'm not here to embarrass you folks. I mean, I'm Kirsten and Robin and I are here to are committed to your growth and your improvement uh, as students of this technology. Uh, I need to understand companies' pain points. Uh, yes. And in fact, let me illustrate uh, that, Tom. So pain points. I mentioned grain chain, right? So, but I didn't tell you about the pain points. So the farmers, um, they can't judge the quality of their own product. 
um, they can, they can't summon. They can look at it. They they know whether they put pesticides on. They know if it was organic or not. Um, but how do you prove that to a buyer, especially when the grain op silo operator is this middle person between you and your buyer? Uh, and the buyers like have very little insight into this grain. They can visit the the silo, but it, it, it's hard to gather the information. It's hard to trust the information. There's a lot of non-transparency. And what this grain chain solution does is they use a lot of IoT devices, Internet of Thing devices, to do something called AIDC, Automated Identification and Data Capture. So uh, what happens is the farmer's in the field. He's, he's in the midst of harvesting. He needs a truck to come and collect what he's harvested and carry it away so he can collect more. And he uses an Uber-style app. You all know what Uber is. It's a, a ride-sharing app. He uses a similar app to say, I'm at this latitude and longitude, and I need this kind of a truck. These truck operators have a copy of the app, and one of them says, I'll take that load, and drives to him. And the system captures the GPS latitude and longitude of where the grain was collected, which identifies provenance, so which eliminates data entry errors that were happening at the silo in terms of you know, whose grain is this. So we're already we're, we're solving a problem with typos and, and, data, and data provenance and, and product provenance. The truck drops the grain off at the silo where it is weighed, measured, and all the weights and measures are automatic. And the data entry is automatic. So it measures the moisture in a moisture measuring machine, boom, straight onto the chain. The weight of the, from the truck dumping it, straight onto, you weigh the truck before and after, you, you subtract, that's the weight of the grain that was just dropped off, straight into the chain. And so we're doing automatic on-chain recording of facts from IoT devices so that everybody, the farmer, the silo operator, the buyer, even the trucker, it's super clear what just happened. If there's a test like for acidity or moisture content or um, presence of pesticides or, or herbicides, all those tests are recorded from the device that does the, that does the measurement straight onto the chain. And so what this let, lets the buyer know is, what am I buying? It lets the farmer know, what am I selling? And the grain operator is no longer the middleman in between them. He just gets paid to store the grain and has a steady, flat, reliable income uh, that's paid for through this process. So that's an example of understanding pain points. And clearly, the grain chain folks spent a lot of time talking to those parties to understand their needs to build a system that, that solves it. 100%. Uh, so Rajani, great summary. Thank you, Rajani. Uh, yes, Justin says, it's like an authenticity certificate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you're doing is you're recording immutably uh, a thing that says, you know, I claim that I'm operating an IoT device and the IoT device just gave out this data and you want no human intervention in that. Uh, and, you know, and Kenneth, great point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, folks. I, I, I feel like we're on the same page. I really appreciate your input. Yeah, uh, and we can jump back into questions at the end of the presentation as well. So, Nagendra, yes, yes, data coming. lineage, excellent. Very alert. All right. So uh, now that everyone has had a chance, hopefully, to go check out the document that I sent over in chat, um, let's right. jump into the stakeholder interview activity. So um, to set up this activity, you first need to recruit two friends or associates and then um, have each of them uh, make a copy of the uh, activity page, the packet that I gave to you. Which we'll show you on screen here in a second. Yes. Uh, in so, fact, you'll see this on the first page, right? Is you, you put in the, the three names of you, you, know, you and, and your, your friends. Yes, and indeed. So, so Robin's on line one, Kirsten's on line two, and I, Thomas, am on line three. And if we were to go through three rounds, then, you know, in the first round, I, I Thomas, will be the subject. That's right. So you see round one is a column there, and next to Thomas it says subject. So that's the role I would play. Robin will be the interviewer, and Kirsten will be the observer. Now, here's what these roles are doing. Uh, you need to come up with some conflict in your life. It does not have to be a business conflict. It's helpful if it's a business conflict, but most importantly, it has to be a conflict because you need as a subject to feel passionate 
It needs to be something that's real for you. And it gives the interviewer the chance to feel empathy for you. Because we're tr this is all about the interviewer practicing empathic listening. The hardest role is the observer, because you're going to want to chime in, don't. And you need to follow both parties. And when they miss each other, and like when they're talking past each other, you got to just shut up and let them do that, but take notes. And notice what does and doesn't work for the interviewer. Notice what does or doesn't work for the subject. You know, is the interviewer showing empathy? Does the subject feel understood? As observer, you're really going to be the, maybe the only one who truly notices what's happening because the other folks get all caught up in the conversation. And because you're each going to take turns, you, what you feel like as, a, as an interviewer, you think, oh, this was a great question. And then when the other person asks the same question of you as the subject, so you're going to feel like, wow, that was a terrible question. And you'll feel what it's like to be heard. So we recommend you do it th uh, th three rounds. Th Thomas, uh, uh, th Thomas, Thomas, just, just a query. This is from KBA. Uh, so uh, do, do we want to have a, a separate breakout room for this? Because uh, this is a common um, Zoom webinar link. So I think for a, for a collaborative thing, say like if participants I, want to collaborate. I would love to have you do a breakout, but I want to demonstrate it first. If we've yeah. got time for a breakout, absolutely yes. Yeah, sure. If we, you don't we, have time for a breakout, okay, we, we fine, have, but at least you'll have seen it in action. Yeah, we, have, we have created a, a breakout room for this. So once you mention, we will share the link on the chat so that the participants can go to breakout room and uh, uh, do the activity. Okay. Good, but not right, yet. Wonderful. Watch the demo first. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, fine. Okay, super. Thank you. All right, and also for this demo, uh, it's not just going to be me who's the observer. It's also going to be you guys. So right. uh, we want you to keep in mind uh, or, or really pay attention to how Robin, uh, the interviewer, and Thomas, the subject, are interacting. Try to come up with critique you have um, and provide that feedback when we prompt you at the end of the activity. So we are in round one and you are the observer. All right, so um, Thomas is the subject. So as the person playing the subject, he has to do a little bit of pre-work to figure out what's the conflict he's gonna talk about. So Thomas, have you thought at all about what kind of conflicts you wanna talk about today? Yes, and, and you'll see here, You know, first think of someone in your life with whom you have an ongoing power struggle or area of ongoing disagreement. And for you, it could be a parent, it could be a boss, could be a coworker, could be a classmate, whoever, sibling. Um, try to not make it too personal, make it something that, uh, but make it sure that it's something that you care about, because if you don't care about it, you won't show any emotion and the interviewer doesn't get a chance to have empathy for you. So my conflict is actually, I'm going to over, I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit. Uh, I've got a neighbor where I used to live who, uh, would routinely make noises late at night and it just bothered me. Like it would wake me up. Um, after a while, it was so bad that as I'm falling asleep, I'm like, wait, I'm like listening for him to make noise because I, I know he's gonna, and I'm sitting, and then they, sometimes he wouldn't, and I'm like waiting for the noise to happen. Like he's gonna argue with his friend, or he's gonna like do, you know, use power tools working on cars at like two, two in the morning when I'm trying to sleep. It's just right next door. It was so annoying. So, uh, what this uh, did for me was, it kind of hurt my quality of life, frankly, because if you can't sleep at night, like it makes the rest of your, your life very unpleasant. You know, you're, you're, you're tired and groggy and, and so on. So, and, and this guy said, so it wasn't just me. Other neighbors would complain too. And he would say, Oh yeah, okay. I'll be different. And then he wouldn't be different. Um, so that's, that's just the outline of it. So that, that's my conflict is the, I had, I had a, nice. a, a, no, a noisy neighbor. Pretty good conflict. Pretty good conflict. So um, now Robin is gonna be the interviewer. So the role of the interviewer is of course, to elicit information and elicit feelings from the subject. Uh, so there are kind of three categories of questions that you can ask to get that information out. Um, so describing any conflicts that are present, uh, looking at good resolutions for the subject in their opinion, and then also looking at uh, asking them to brainstorm good solutions for all parties involved, um, which is very important when engaging in uh, collectives, generally speaking. Right. So um, now we're going to ask Robin to ask Thomas a couple questions uh, relating to 
uh, his conflict. So Robin, pretend like you haven't heard any of that pre-work that Thomas just did. Come in and blank um, and then start with your questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Thomas, um, so what's bothering you? Tell okay, me what's on yeah. Your yeah, yeah. So the, the, the thing I did in my preparation, Robin, was I thought about a conflict, and my conflict is with this neighbor. So here, here's, here's the thing. Um, the neighbor will, uh, when, I lived, when I lived there, he, he would, not every night, but enough nights to be really irksome. He would either get into a shouting match with some friend of his at like midnight, uh, or he'd like pull out power tools and start like working on a car at one or two in the morning like grinding or, or some kind of loud repair work on a car. His uh, were friends. Um, he was always collecting discarded like junk. And, you know, I just, honestly, I suspect some of it was stolen, like bikes and bike parts were going through there. Uh, and I could see right at, you know, I'm on the second floor in my bedroom and I can see right down into his yard and there's this ever changing collection of junk in there. Uh, and it's ugly. Uh, and it's always, you know, something he's taking apart or putting together. It, it's just nasty. And so, um, and it's not just me. I mean, the other neighbors are unhappy too, right? We sometimes talk to each other about it. And sometimes someone will file a noise complaint with the city because there is a noise ordinance. Um, you know, and I'm worried about my wife because my wife's an even lighter sleeper than I am. And, you know, you, you can imagine how much fun it isn't to have a, bleary eyed morning trying to be effective with your spouse when neither one of you got a good night's sleep. So yeah, this, this guy, you know, if, if you talk to him, he says, Oh, you all be quiet. And then he doesn't. So I just, yeah, that's, that's my conflict. Okay. So you said others who are affected by this, uh, with other neighbors as well as your wife. Oh Yeah. Yeah, I'm across the street from him. This other guy, I think his name is Sean, was is just likely ne next door on the same street on the other side of the fence. Uh, neighbor across the street, people who walk by who live a couple doors down. I mean, if you're within earshot, you hear it. So, why do you think like you talk to him? So, why do you think that he is, um, you know, repeating uh, and not the, uh, you know? Why is he not? Know, uh, I think he's just a night person. I think he sleeps all day and he's awake all night, and that's that's when he likes to do his, you know, mechanic stuff. It just that timing works for him, mm -hmm. I guess. So, in terms of uh, your wife, so what does your wife say about this uh, situation? So oh, how does she, she hates about it. it? She hates it, but she doesn't want me to even talk to him. She just, why is that? She, she's scared. She, she, she once complained about noise at some place where she lived alone, and the neighbor she complained about like came over and threatened her physically. And so she's afraid that might happen, and she just doesn't want to make the, a bad situation worse. And so there's another tension for you, is that you know I, I want to like change things to make it better, and she's afraid to do anything that might expose us to you know risk so uh -huh. yeah i'm kind of caught okay, like I, uh, I she doesn't even want me complaining to the city okay so um what you, what would you say is at stake for you uh if you do complain or you know well you know it was it said well what's the stake with me with the noise is you know can i get a get a nice sleep can my wife get any sleep uh can we enjoy the sanctity of our home can we enjoy peace and quiet in our own home um you know do we feel safe in our home uh all those things are at stake for me um and, to, and if i want to be fair it's like you know he needs to be able to you know do useful things for money he's probably charging money or doing favors and he wants to be able to use his mechanical expertise and help people and and, you know, engage in his whatever business activity that is he's doing. Like, he wants to be able to do that. He's got bills to pay. So it's not like his needs are illegitimate. I just wish he were quiet. 
Okay. Uh, so, wh- what what do you think would be uh, like? You talk to him. So, what do you think his side of the story would be? Like, wh- what do you think he has suggested? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think that he's just this kind of loud, boisterous guy, and when he gets into a fight, he yells. You know, no big deal. But some people are loud, and some people are quiet, and he's on the loud side. Uh, and he just, you know, he's just being himself. Um, I think that he, uh, you know, wants to be able to enjoy the use of his own property for his own activities. Um, he wants to be able to use his skills to earn a living and help friends. He wants to have his friends come over. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. You, you notice, by the way, I'm going to pause this for a second. You know, you'll notice, folks, that I like, oh, that's another thing. People do that all the time. You think they've su- finished a subject, and as you're summarizing, they go, like, oh, yeah, and then there's this other thing. Very common. That's one of the reasons you want to go slow and, and, and recap things for folks. So, yeah, another thing. His friends would come by. A lot of them have these, like, stereos in the back of the car, like, have this really super loud, deep subwoofer, but you can you feel it more than you hear it, and they listen to this annoying music with, like, this thumping, and and sound insulation blocks high frequencies not low frequencies so it like the whole house shakes and they're sitting there idling in their car chatting with them out the window while the music is playing a boom 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 two in the morning oh my gosh so annoying okay uh so let's see so um by the way folks robin was not preloaded like uh, oh yeah we've we have we have next door neighbors on one side of us they've been there well i should say we've moved so this isn't happening anymore i'm I'm telling you a story about the past but the next door neighbor on one side been there for seven years they talked to him off and on for seven years he kept saying oh yeah i'll 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 be quiet and he never does so have you have you people collectively tried to persuade him uh, I don't think there's really been an effective collective response. I think a lot of folks have talked to him one-on-one. So do you think that uh, if there was a more of a collective response um, regarding this issue, he would have probably, uh, you know, had a different... I think if the neighbors were united um, and, you know, pooled our, th- our thoughts and resources and experiences, I think that, you know, it might be more persuasive for the city government to take action. Uh, or might be more persuasive to him if he had this more united front, uh, people all all telling him the same thing in the same way. Um, you know, I mean, maybe there's an out of the box solution. Maybe there's some way to like f- find him some commercial car repair location where he could like have his tools be there and his friends come visit him at you know, with two in the morning in a commercial district. That's not a residential district. That's not next to my house. That's not next to these neighbors. And he can like wander on down there and tinker on cars at two in the morning where there aren't people sleeping. So, um, so this idea of yours, uh, have you uh, tried uh, to tell it to him? Oh God, no. Like I said, my my wife doesn't want to say, uh, didn't want me to say anything to him. So I, okay. I, it's like that just gets you more and more into, involved in that person's business. And then if he's unhappy, he's going to come over at two in the morning and start kicking the door down okay. is her fear. It's like, so, and who knows? So um, instead of going individually, do you think if, if as collectively as a unit? Uh, so, so Robin's no longer listening. Robin's involved in problem solving. Yeah. Okay. Which so. is not what we want. Very common, folks. You go like, oh, this sounds so difficult. Well, but what if you just, or hey, how about? It's like, no, 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 no. Ask what, what has been tried or what has been talked about but not yet tried. But and how does it make you feel? Yeah, right. And, and, and how does it feel? So, yeah, so I'm caught. Like, on the one hand, I, I'd like to make it be different. On the other hand, my wife is so scared of this guy and, and her fears of what somebody might do if they're confronted and, like, you know. Because there are people in the world, if you know, if you complain about them to an authority, they'll, they'll like try to punish you. They'll like come after you. And who wants that? 
So there's this strong incentive to be quiet. Mm-hmm. Got to say, it was a pretty good conflict while it lasted. <laughs> yeah. So uh, do you want me to summarize it? That'd be super. Yeah. All right. So Thomas, the issue that you're facing is that you have, in, in, basically you have a noisy neighbor. So he, he or she, whoever it is, uh, m- makes noise. Um, almost every night, not every night, but almost every night, uh, you know, brings over uh, his friends or stereos, blasting music at, at late hours, maybe at uh, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Um, and then this, this annoys not only you, but also your wife, uh, who's looking to have some quiet sleep, uh, who, who's probably tired from work, uh, from all day and who's trying to just rest and, uh, you know, and, and then, and not only that, uh, the ones who are affected by this is your other neighbors who are also living in a residential area. And, uh, so that's there. Um, so, and what's at stake for you is your sleep, uh, your, the, the, uh, the alone time that you want to have, uh, the peaceful time that you want to have that you expect at night, especially in the right. residential area. So right. it, does that summarize your uh, problem? Yeah. And also, you know, my, my wife's sense of safety. Mm, yeah. Also that. So yeah, right. you also think that, that if you confront it, uh, you, you think yeah. you're safe. Yeah. And I'm frustrated because, you know, I'm a problem solver. I'd, I'd love to engage in some sort of creative problem solving, but you know, I can't without making my wife even more scared. So I kind of just have back when this was a, an active thing, you know, I, I'm taking a past thing and pretending it's present. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I felt pretty caught between conflicting interests. Mm-hmm. Okay. Great summary, Robin. Thank you. Okay. Kirsten S. Observer. Yeah. I've got all my notes here. There we go. Hopefully you and the audience do as well. How did Robin do? Um, so most of my feedback is for Robin. I tried to get some feedback for you as well. Uh, Let me just get to my observer page real quick before I start. All right. So, um, I'll give some critique for Robin first. Um, I'll start reverse chronological order. That was a really fantastic summary. Um, and more than that, it was wonderful that after you gave the summary, you asked, is that correct? Or like, does that, does that float with you or, you know, whatever you want to say, because yeah, high high marks. Yeah. That was just so good. Um, Cause a a lot of people like they're, they're interviewing and like at the end, they don't really summarize, like generally that's just a really fantastic thing to do in regardless of what circumstances you're in. Like, say you're in a meeting with someone or you're talking on the phone with a professor just having that little summary at the end to be like, yeah, is that what happened? And that way you have that little chunk to walk away with. Um, and it really shows that you are listening as well. So that was great. Um, so Thomas, uh, I thought that in the beginning you were using some loaded language in relation to the neighbor. I thought that you were being, uh, you know, very negative towards the neighbor, which of course that's how oh, you I feel. Was. I completely yeah. understand. But something interesting that I observed is as Robin um, began to ask you to think from the neighbor's perspective, you started to significantly reduce that loaded language and was like, well, you know, he he just is a guy who wants to live his life and who am I to do this and that. Of course, you still have your feelings. You still have your desires. You want to solve this. It doesn't help me sleep. (laughs) Yes. Empathy but, doesn't help but, you sleep, but... But, <laughs> but it does prevent me from demonizing this, this neighbor. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that this is something that uh, can come up when you're dealing with competitors operating in one network very frequently. Um, they'll have, you know, all of these fears and moments of demonization when uh, discussing their relations with other parties that they, you know, are competitors, partial competitors with, um, but... Right. You have to break past that barrier um, of them setting up that image that they have of the other party, considering, you know, that this network, it's coming together 
with competitors on board. That's how blockchain solutions work. If it's um, going to be a shared source of truth, you're going to have competitors. You're going to have yeah. people who are routinely exchanging value with each other, sometimes acrimoniously. Uh, there may mm -hmm. be past instances of you know questionable dealing that people are carrying around as grudges. So yeah, it can mm -hmm. it can be pretty pretty fraught. Yep, yep. Um, some other specific questions that I liked from you, Robin, uh, were very simple ones, such as, why is that? So it's getting Thomas or the subject to talk a little bit more about uh, what he was just describing. Uh, it shows that you are interested in what he's saying at that given moment, and also helps Thomas to just expand um, what he's talking about to different tangential areas, which can be good. Tangents can be good in interviews because it shows you how the other party thinks. Yeah. And one of my favorite phrases, and I invite everyone to try this out with your friends, loved ones, and when you're practicing being the interviewer, it's a two word statement. You just say, say more, just say more. That's all you have to say. That's a nice and, one. Yeah. Yeah. You can get a lot of value from folks by just acknowledging that you're listening. You want to say more. Yeah. Um, and then the only other item that I wanted to talk about was, I feel like, Robin, you could have been a little bit more empathetic, or at least you, you probably were being empathetic, but you need to demonstrate that a little bit better. Um, so... At no Perhaps. point did Robin say, I am, well, that must yeah, the, have I felt, imagine. Yeah. I imagine that felt really blank. It was all that very was missing like piece. data capture. Yeah. We yeah, were yeah, capturing we a lot of great data. As engineers, but... we often want to be in analysis mode and yeah. you're going to analyze this interview. I promise you, you will, but you, you do want to also feel empathy and express empathy, not like inappropriately. Because in a blockchain context, you're, this is a business relationship. Yeah. Uh, but in the practice, it may not be a business example. And you just feel free to like go over the top a little bit with this because we're, we're, come on, we're all students of human nature. We're all trying to do this out. This is a practice. So you're allowed to like get a little wacky just to yeah. try out yeah. things maybe you wouldn't do in, in real life. Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, how much time do we have left? Do we have time to do a breakout? Or, is there, or do people have questions? I guess I should say. Uh, I know we've got a lingering question from uh, Najendra uh, from earlier, but any questions on the demo you just saw, or even let me let me ask a different question. What was your favorite part of the empathic listening example? Justin makes a great point that mm hmm will make a subject know that the interviewer is listening. Yes, Justin, thank you. Totally true. Yeah, just uh huh, uh huh, mm hmm. Just making a noise that is an encouraging, like, I heard what you just said. I'm still here. I'm still listening. That is very powerful. You're not agreeing with them. You're not adding your own two cents. You're just there. It's good to get into the habit of doing that. It, it's a very effective at getting people to keep talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great one, Justin. Thank you. Uh, so real quick, type in, if you would, until he's into chat, one thing that stands out from you for you in, in listening to the interview and especially Robin's questions and, and, and how, the, how the interviewer guided the interview and how the emotions were handled or not handled, right? What, what did you notice? What stands out in your mind? And so Kenneth, Najendra, Rajani, Tom, Justin. Um, and others. And everybody else, yeah. You'll notice I, I, I call out the names of folks who've spoken. Very important, folks, if you want to engage uh, with stakeholders, is don't be afraid to ask a question or make a comment that demonstrates that you're paying attention. Uh, teachers love that. Guest lecturers love that. Uh, it's a good way to get visibility for yourself as a, a young professional, is you know, asking the intelligent question can really spark a conversation. So people are not taking me up on my offer to say in chat what stood out for them. So I'm going to assume nothing stood out. That's unfortunate. Rajani, listening all the way. Rajani, say more. And while Rajani's typing, please, the rest of you. And while Rajani is finishing typing his sentence 
as he says more, uh, I'll ask our admin if what our time availability is and do we really have time for breakout? Uh, no, no, no. We actually have the next session at 8 o'clock. Uh, like, uh, we have okay. left two, three minutes left. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep, Rajani. Yeah, about the rules in the community. Thank you, Rajani. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really a wonderful session. Like, uh, even though we uh, didn't get to give it a try in the breakout rooms, the demo itself was uh, quite impressive. It was really helpful. And Thomas and uh, Robin together made it really wonderful. And the observations from uh, Kristen was also. And, uh, the, and finally, the same old tip was uh, quite impressive uh, again. So uh, thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, thank you, Robin. It was a great workshop to learn. Yeah. Truly our pleasure. Thank you so much for having us.